I'd like to invite our first speaker up to the stage. Noemi Al Haddad is an associate professor of biomedical informatics at Columbia University. Please join me in welcoming Noemi. Thanks so much, Jenna. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I want to thank the organizers. It's really nice to be here. Last time I was here was in 2012 when it was called MacMed, so the seat wasn't there. Um, but I'm very happy to be here. So I'm going to be talking to you about um, what used to be a side project in my lab and became very central to the type of research we do. And it's not your typical machine learning problem, but bear with me and hopefully I can inspire you to think about the type of problems we're tackling. So I have no conflict of interest to report for this particular work, and I'm hiring. Come talk to me. Um, OK, so I'm going to be talking to you about a disease called endometriosis. Um, if you were to ask a gynecologist what endometriosis is, they would tell you that it's a very mechanistic um, disease where there are cells that typically would grow inside the uterus that happen to uh, grow outside of the uterus, and they form lesions into a woman's body. Um, the only way to diagnose it is through surgery, and symptoms would be dysmenorrhea, which means pain during a woman's period, and infertility. Treatments would be surgical, as well as hormonal, in order to suppress menstruation. If you were to ask an epidemiologist what endometriosis is, they would tell you that uh, we think there are one in 10 women in reproductive age um, affected by the disease. We also know that there is a delayed diagnosis to the disease between 4 and 17 years, depending on the countries. There is no established risk factors. We know of some uh, increased risk, and there is a high morbidity, on average 10 hours a week per productivity. If you were to ask a clinical researcher now what endometriosis is, they would tell you that we're not really sure um, how many phenotypes there are to the disease. Um, maybe four, if you think of it surgically by pathology and histological reports but uh, maybe three, we're not sure. Uh, there's no known biomarkers to diagnose or monitor progression, no understanding of which treatments will work for whom, and there's no cure. Uh, there's been some SNPs identified through GWAS, but they all have a very low explanatory power. And so I like this quote by uh, Dr. Wilson, which characterizes endometriosis as a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Um, and these are just some examples of papers that are very recent, including one in January 2019, that keeps talking about how we know nothing about the disease. And this is such a mysterious disease and enigmatic condition. So, you know, one question we can ask ourselves is, OK, so the gynecologists, the epidemiologists, the clinical researchers are all telling us this information about the disease. What about the patients? This is just an example of a study we had done, a survey we had done with about 1,000 patients. Uh, and these are the different body locations that they told us they had chronic pain with. And these are the other diagnoses that they had been um, diagnosed with. So there's a lot of comorbidities in there. And these are some of the quotes they told us. Um, you know, if you take the time to read them, they're very uh, hard to read because they're talking about entire lives being uh, affected by the disease and uh, a lot of regret and grief from patients because of the disability that comes with the disease. In fact, this is not a the only case with endometriosis, there's a lot of uh, what we call invisible diseases out there, where uh, I really like this, uh, this drawing out there, which I think summarizes it well, uh, which talks about these chronic diseases where there's no outside symptoms, but inside there's a lot of suffering from patients. And there are a lot of interesting care challenges related to those. In part, how do we diagnose this type of diseases when all of the symptoms are not your typical test labs and other types of conditions. So the problem that 
we know for sure for endometriosis is that there is kind of a disconnect between the way patients experience the disease and the current scientific characterization. So on one hand, we have a very surgical uh, characterization of the disease with only two types of symptoms, pain during period and infertility. And on the other side, we have patients who are telling us that their entire body is broken. The current characterizations seem to ignore all of these symptoms and their temporal trajectories in particular. And so that has a lot of uh, really critical impact implications. So one is it impacts detection, it impacts monitoring, it impacts research because we don't have the data to go and identify all these symptoms out there, but it also impacts the patients beyond their health. Um, what we find when we talk to uh, our endometriosis patients is that they have basically lost uh, their trust in the medical system. They feel alone, they feel unheard, and they feel frustrated. So this is not a isolated problem when it comes to women's health. This is the only feminist side of the talk. Um, if you don't know about the gender biases in healthcare, I, I encourage you to read this paper from 2001, which is kind of a seminal paper in the field called The Girl Who Cried Pain, a bias among women in the treatment of pain. And if you want to spend more time, I encourage you to read this book called Doing Harm, which is a very systematic review of gender biases in healthcare and science. Okay, so there are two research questions we want to tackle here. The first one is, how do we characterize the different ways in which patients experience endometriosis? And second, how do we support individuals with managing their disease? So, my student, Molly McKillop, uh, when she started her PhD, did a content analysis of 1,200 articles about endometriosis. Now, the first thing you should notice if you've done a survey of a of literature about diseases is that 1,200 articles about an entire disease is very little. Um, you know, if you were to type diabetes in PubMed, you would have way more articles out there, which really already talks about the lack of research on the disease. Um, these are all the different signs and symptoms, conditions, uh, different dimensions, if you want, that have been talked about in the literature, and we find that as expected, the most frequent ones are pain and infertility, and there are a few others. So the first thing we did is we went to uh, our clinical record. At Columbia University, we have access to about 5 million patients. We also, at Columbia University, are the coordinating center for Odyssey. And if you don't know what Odyssey is, I encourage you to go look at odyssey.org, uh, which is an observational health data network throughout the world. And we found uh, that we needed to first select a cohort of endometriosis patients. We needed to uh, define a phenotype. In other words, define a query to select this cohort. Uh, looking, as you know, in this audience, looking at diagnosis codes alone is not enough. So we went ahead and built such a cohort. We, um, in fact, tried different cohort selection algorithm and validated on manual record uh, chart review, uh, and so this is what we ended up with. We looked at um, many different databases. These are all in the United States, and it's a mix of claims and EHR data. We uh, took a comparison cohort of basically all women in reproductive age. This is about 190 million women. And we, out of those, looked at how many had been actually diagnosed with endometriosis and we found 2.28 million of those. So, remember I told you that the epidemiologists have told us that there's an estimated one in 10 women in reproductive age. The first finding, this is not what we're finding. Uh, we have a very low prevalence here of women who actually have the diagnosis. And so, you know, there's different ways in which we can interpret this. One is that indeed the estimate is really an estimate, and because there's such a lag to diagnosis, there's probably many women who go on without being diagnosed. Um, we don't know. Is it actually less? We really have no idea at this point. So the first thing we did was literally just a characterization. So 
we looked at um, all of their conditions. So this is just at their entry into the cohort, meaning at the time of diagnosis, these are all the type of condition that these patients have been diagnosed with. Um, and we find this dysmenorrhea and this female infertility, but those are not the most prevalent symptoms. And I'm showing to you in light pink uh, the, the prevalence amongst the comparison cohort of 190 million patients. And you know, I think the first, uh, the first thing we want to see here is that indeed, in fact, the observational data tells us more than what the gynecologist and the guideline tell us, uh, and seem to already get in line with the experience of patients, right? There are a lot of different conditions out there. These are some of the um, medications that are being um, prescribed to these patients. Um, analgesics, which means uh, pain medication, opioids, antidepressants, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and the one again that are provided by guidelines, which are hormone um, hormone type of medications, are present, but again, are not the most prevalent ones. Okay, so there's a wider range of problems experienced by patients. So now, if we find that the observational data sets are more in line with the patients, what do the patients tell us? Uh, we decided to ask them and start collecting the data, but beyond this type of surveys, which are kind of a one-shot you know, type of questions. And so our idea here is to think about self-tracking as a personal health informatics tool and a way to collect new data about the disease so that we can then analyze it and try to really get at the question of what is endometriosis. So we did a thing that was very unusual for my lab. I'm more of a computational lab. We went and talked to patients. Uh, and we did interviews, we did focus groups, we did more online surveys, and we also, because my original research expertise is in natural language processing, we also went and analyzed content of online endometriosis community discussions. And so we found a variety of interesting things about our population, and everything that I'm gonna to talk to you kind of informed the design of our self-tracking tools. So first we found that there were many dimensions that patients were interested in telling researchers about when thinking about endometriosis. Pain was obviously one, menstruation as well, but there was a variety of other symptoms, most of them being uh, GI, urinary, but also systemic to the entire body. Self-management strategies were very important to patients, treatments as well. Temporality of the symptom was a fascinating um, aspect of the disease where patients explain to us that their symptoms are not varying month to month, not even day to day, but moment by moment. And so it was very important to them to distinguish between their pain in the morning, through the afternoon, through the evening, or even at night. And they were really interested in the functional aspect of the disease, meaning what could they do or what could they not do um, based on the disease, and they wanted to be able to track this. The online surveys added more refinement to the things that we had found about uh, through the focus groups, and the content analyses uh, because it was about a much larger number of patients, was able to tell us even more. Um, one thing that was interesting is, at first when we did an identity recognition about the different symptoms that were, um, and conditions that were mentioned, some of the most prevalent were things like drug seeker, hypochondria, somatic sy sy symptom disorder, and it didn't seem to fit with what the patients had told us. And in fact, uh, when we went back and tried to annotate what was attributed by others rather than by the patients themselves, we found out that these were all the things that the healthcare system was telling them. So patients are in pain, go to the emergency department, and they're told that they're a drug seeker, for example. So what I want to point out here is, this is an online community, there's potentially some biases here, right? In part, talking about the negative experience with the healthcare system. Um, I think you know, we need to take this with a grain of salt, 
Talking to other patients, there are definitely issues, and thinking about the gender bias healthcare literature, there are issues, but I don't think these are representative of uh, the patient experience by any means. Okay, so we asked also uh, patients why they wanted to track, like was there any feasibility to our goal of building a self-tracking tool? And um, we were very excited because they told us exactly what we wanted to hear, which was that they were motivated to self-track for themselves, but also for others. For themselves, um, they wanted to manage their symptoms. For others, they had two goals. One, they thought that if they could go to their doctor and show on a sign of paper their symptoms self-tracked, it would look way more objective to the doctor and they could convince their doctor about the range and the scope of the, of the disease for them. Um, but also they were, they kind of had this idea of there's another teenage girl somewhere and I don't want her to go through what I went through, so I want to help research. And they really got into the idea of citizen science, of contributing data and participating into research to um, change the state of, of affairs for endometriosis. So, we uh, decided to take all of these findings and um, went ahead and built a tool. We created a project called Citizen Endo. The whole point was to really go very strongly with the idea of citizen science and patient advocacy uh, as a way to engage patients. Uh, so we have a lot of social media, we have a blog that's quite active where we talk about research but explain it to patients. Uh, this is me on a HuffPost, we did a Reddit AMA, we're really trying very hard to talk to patients and to um, other patient advocacy groups. And this is a lot of work, by the way. We have uh, three volunteers who help with social media and talk to patients. We get a lot of emails from patients. And we also built a research-based app to self-track endometriosis. So this is based on Research Kit. We actually customize Research Kit a little bit further to add customization of responses, editing, uh, retroactive tracking if you feel like you want to change your mind. It's available on uh, all sorts of smartphones. And uh, these are the type of things. Remember I told you like temporality is really important. So we have two ways of tracking, um, tracking the moment, tracking symptoms uh, at the day level and, and more specific questions like pain, um, mood, bleeding, medications, etc. And what you see on the right is a functional assessment of your day. So as of this morning we have we're two people shy of uh, 10,000, <laughs> so anybody has endometriosis here, if you want to sign up, that would make me very happy. <laughs> um, we have a lot of uh, participants from many different countries. This is an English uh, app, um, and overall they have tracked together about 225,000 moments and 122,000 days. If you count every observation, an observation being an instance of pain or an instance of a medication, we have about 1.7 million of those. Um, we have a strong engagement, or a median uh, number of days is four, which is along uh, most of the research apps out there. But we have a nice cluster of patients who have been using the, the app for quite a long time. So we're able to have a nice longitudinal view of the disease. The thing on your right here uh, shows that people are actually tracking a lot in the evening, but also track throughout the day. Uh, we have a nice peak around notification times, which tells us that yes, notification help. Um, and the other thing I wanted to show was that we have this retroactive tracking, which is a very customized feature of research kit type of apps, where you can go back, uh, you know, say you forgot to track something yesterday, you can go and, and say that, or two days ago, or three days ago. And we found uh, exactly what we would suspect, that people track in a very reasonable fashion. Um, the things they track up to two and three days ago are their period and their sexual activities, which we think is very uh, normal, whereas things that are much more um, you know, day to day, like pain, GI, bleeding, etc., are tracked within a day or two at most. 
Okay, so this is um, this was early on, but the picture is pretty much the same now. Um, we are able to create just by simple de descriptive statistics here um, a picture of endometriosis pain. And already my point is that this looks very different from um, the typical dysmenorrhea period pains, right? Which would mean pelvic cramps. Um, there's a lot of back pain, a lot of um, pelvic pain for sure, but also other systemic aspects and much more generalized pain uh, on the rectum, the hips, the vagina, etc. Oh, this one worked, okay. Um, so some examples of uh, GI and urinary symptoms. Um, other symptoms, and the reason I'm showing this very quickly is just to get you a sense of uh, these are the, there's a lot of, uh, of data there, but there's also a broad range of symptoms that patients are telling us about. Um, food and exercises that help and don't help, um, you know, walking, for example, and running are, it seems, controversial exercises. It helps some people, it hurts others. We ask them to, this is just based on self-reports. We're not doing any analytics here yet. Um, food, people try your usual chronic disease type of, of diets, right? So gluten-free, dairy-free, uh, etc. These are the type of medications. Uh, and here I'm showing you a slightly different visualization. But in fact, this uh, is interesting to us because it validates very well the observational data and the patient-generated data because they actually match very well to each other. In other words, patients tell us the truth or maybe tell us the same thing that the healthcare system tells us. Okay, so what did we do with this, all this data? The first question we wanted to answer was, um, can we go back to this um, long-standing question of what are the different phenotypes of endometriosis? So the idea is if it's heterogeneous uh, disease, and we think it's heterogeneous because there's such a broad range of symptoms and a broad range of responses to treatment, um, what can we find about the subtypes of the disease? Okay, and um, you know, we have some constraints in the data. Um, in fact, self-tracking data looks a lot like EHR data. Uh, data is tracked irregularly, imperfectly probably, uh, and there's um, different types of data. In our case, we have kind of these different dimensions of data like pain and GI, moods, etc. So this was work we presented last year at MLHC, in fact, and so I'll go fairly quickly through it. This was from uh, Inigo Ortega in my lab. Um, we used an unsupervised probabilistic model, a mixed membership model, and we extended it to accommodate all these different dimensions. Uh, I don't expect you to read this, but we found that there were um, most likely three phenotypes that explained the best the data. And we grouped um, the most likely symptoms per dimension. So I'll just run you through some of them, where we find that there are some um, very specific symptoms that seem to be uh, mostly associated with one phenotype versus another one. Um, GIGU, they all have this endobelly, which is a very known symptom of endometriosis. It's due to inflammation. There's a lot of swelling of the abdomen, and that's how patients call it. Uh, but then there are other things that were, again, very specific to this phenotype, uh, frequent urination and painful urination. There didn't seem to be much of those symptoms in the patients with the other, as assigned to the other phenotypes. So we evaluated these uh, three phenotypes in many ways. Uh, we asked experts to cluster a number of patients and we looked at the comparison between the phenotypes assignment and the expert assignments. We also had a lengthy medical uh, questionnaire that the patients had uh, provided to us and so we looked at potential associations between the phenotype assignment and what they told us in their clinical record and in fact they were very interesting finding most of them showing to us that there was basically a severe uh, moderate and a quote-unquote mild uh, phenotype uh, available in the data 
one question we were interested in was, are we in fact uh, clustering people by their tracking uh, behaviors? And the answer is not. Uh, we're, we're really finding, I think, a symptom signal rather than tracking signal. So here I'm showing you what happens when we are ordering by the number of, the, of days tracked or the number of observation tracked, if they tracked a lot per day. And we find that there's no correlation with their phenotype assignment. Okay, so I want to move on to um, the next question. We're still doing a lot of work on the first, on the first question, but I kind of want to give you a, a range of the type of, of research that we're doing here. Um, so remember, we had the patients tell us during focus groups, like, why would you use this self-tracking data? One was, you know, we want to help research. The other is, I want to help myself to discover what works and what doesn't for me, and I want to be able to communicate with my providers. So we have very uh, basic functionality in the apps currently. Uh, you know, this was an app that was built on a research budget, so we tried. Um, we have a calendar that just tells you, you know, these are the days that you tracked. We have a very basic kind of a circular uh, sunburst type of, um, you know, summary of the past 30 days. And we have a very basic just uh, description kind of printout slash export of all of your um, tracked data if you wanted to print it and go to your doctor. But obviously this is not enough. Um, there are a few issues with this. Um, the first one is that this is still, you know, there's no summary here. It's just the day-to-day -day and uh, everything that happened. And there, it's very unlikely that doctors would want to even look at this type of information. Um, so we want to do two things. We want to support the patients and their providers to make sense of their experience of disease. Uh, and to reach a shared decision-making in managing their health. So decision, shared decision-making, uh, for those of you of in, in the audience who don't know what we mean by that, it's kind of like what you would expect should happen in healthcare and doesn't, uh, which is basically that uh, you know, you go to the doctor and the doctor is like, these are the options, let's discuss them. What are your goals? What are your values? Okay, let's reach, let's negotiate a little and let's reach a decision. And that's not typically how care goes, but you know, that's what your decision making is. So we went back to um, human-computer interaction principles here and said, if uh, we want to go and uh, here, you know, build these tools that are going to take this self-tracking data and make it actually useful for providers and patients now, not for research anymore. How would we go about this? And so we um, did interviews with uh, 10 providers, um, and we looked at all the different types of endometriosis specialists there are out there. We have um, gynecology surgeons, uh, gynecology surgeons who spe specialize in endometriosis surgeries, we had physiatrists, uh, pelvic, fan phys pelvic physical therapists, uh, which are a specific type of physical therapist, and pen specialist. We also did uh, focus groups with um, about 21 patients, I think, yeah. Um, and we had a, a range of types of patients. I think for us, that was the most interesting part, was that we, look, we asked them, you know, where they were in their endometriosis journey uh, in terms of since their diagnosis. Uh, and so we had some, most of them had been somewhat recently diagnosed in the past five years. And uh, we had a few that were kind of more mature patients in their understanding of endometriosis, but also of the healthcare journey. And this is just an example of um, the type of notes we take during those focus groups. So, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on, the, on that slide because I think that's important. And I think it's also very uh, generalizable to other chronic diseases out there. Uh, and not only the invisible ones, in fact. So 
we remember we want to know how do we build tools that can help patients and providers get together and help uh, patients make sense of their disease. And we found that uh, patients and providers agreed in many ways, but also disagreed. And there was quite a lot of divergence um, among them, and those are the things we want to tackle in the tools that we're building. So patients and provider agreed about the fact that a care team was essential. And uh, especially in a chronic disease like endometriosis, it's multifactorial, it's systemic to the entire body. You know, it is useful to have the pelvic pain therapist and the physiatrist and the, and the surgeon, etc. And all of these doctors should talk to each other. They also agreed that the clinical history, the data that is you know, um, documented in the, in the electronic health record, but also self-tracking data were very, very valuable. So uh, keep that in mind, you know, providers were extremely enthusiastic about self-tracking data, but you know, just keep it in mind for when we go down the slide. <laughs> um, care and clinical encounters both patients and providers agreed were highly constrained, uh, and in many ways. First, they agreed that there was just no time. So a typical uh, first, um, first visit with a gynecologist is 30 minutes, and a general visit is 15 minutes. Uh, it goes very quickly, right? Um, but it was also difficult because, uh, like other invisible diseases and, and chronic conditions, there are a lot of dimensions to handle. There's a pain, there's a GI issue, there's a gynecological issues, there may be some thoracic issues. And lastly, um, this is, might be more specific to endometriosis, because there's so little scientific knowledge and so, so little guidelines about potential treatments, um, well, there was sometimes not much to discuss during an encounter because patients would say, these are my complaints, and providers would agree that, well, there's not much we can do about this. Finally, uh, both providers and patients agreed that trust is really critical, and if a patient doesn't trust their care providers, then nothing's gonna happen. Um, they also agreed that because there was no cure, um, managing expectations was really important. And so providers kept talking about how most of their encounters is them managing down the expectations of the patients. And when I say that the patients agree with this, I don't mean that they agree they should have their expectations managed, but they agreed with the observation that their expectations were managed, to be clear. Um, so patients and providers were in disagreement in a lot of things. Um, the first one was their approach to assessing health. And this is, to me, the, the primary finding here of these focus groups and interviews. Um, providers care about long-term progressions. They want to know things like, how are you, have you been feeling for in the past three months? And maybe if some of you have gone to see their providers recently, that's a, that's a known question. They ha they're not asking, how are you feeling between yesterday and today, right? But patients, when we ask them, how would you answer these questions, were unanimous in their answer. They don't know how to answer these questions. They're so busy thinking about their day-to-day -day that they actually have no idea how they've been doing over the past three months or year, etc. They can tell you they've been overall feeling pretty crappy or they think they've been doing better, but that's very, you know, that's about it. And so while the patients are steeped in their day-to-day, -day, providers are kind of looking at a different temporal resolution, and maybe that's one of the bottleneck to communication here, that patients are going to answer in a very vague way to their providers, and as a consequence, providers would say, OK, well, it seems like it's going well, or it seems like it's not going well. Another way in which um, providers and patients disagreed extensively was with respect to the care team. So providers assumed that the patients were at the center of the care team and were seemingly uh, managing the care team. Um, patients felt like this was a crazy burden on them that not only were they sick, but now they have to go and talk to the surgeon, get some information from the surgeon, 
go to the pelvic floor therapist, get some information, go back to this other one. And indeed, they're at the middle, but they feel completely lost as to what information is interesting to which provider and how they can get them to agree about a treatment. If you guys have done some work on care coordination within a, within a hospital, a lot of these questions are similar. The patient is not expected to be at the center of it, but there are definitely breakdown in communication. And so, again, some of these findings, I think, are generalizable, not only to patient-provider interaction, but also to general coordination in a care team. Finally, um, shared decision-making, this idea that patients are part of the decisions. Um, if when we ask providers, they all unanimously, again, said that, yes, it was happening. Patients, the way they described their, their workflow was they ask the goals of the patients, they ask for their values and priorities, things like, do you want a fertility-preserving treatment, for example? Do you want to be on hormone therapy? What type of side effects are you trying to avoid here? And then they would choose a treatment with them. Patients told us a very different story, uh, some very concerning stories about um, surgeries where they didn't know what type of organs would be removed from them in advance, two simple things like doctors never ask me for my goals. In fact, they didn't even know what a management goal could be. So I want to end this talk. Um, we are very busy right now taking all of this information. We just finished these interviews and focus groups with patients. We have a lot of ideas about um, how to combine and synthesize all of this. It's bringing in a lot of analytics problems that we care about, some uh, like summarization of data, combining heterogeneous data from the medical record and from self-tracking data into a holistic view of a patient. These are all very interesting problems. But I want to end on just, you know, stepping up a little bit and uh, remind you that there are a lot of diseases like endometriosis out there that are chronic, invisible. In women's health, there are a lot of them, but there are other diseases. Uh, and our goal here is to really bridge the gap between patients, care providers, and researchers, and to deliver on the promise of patient-centered care. Sure, decision-making is an essential component of patient-centered care, but there are other parts to it. And I guess I also want to add that, and this is more a message for my fellow machine learning people, um, just you know, go beyond existing data set once in a while and go beyond the convenient questions that can be answered just because there's a data set uh, in front of you. Those are useful and we want to have replicability and all sorts of things for sure, but there are also a lot of problems that machine learning for healthcare can help with. And also I'm hiring. Uh, okay, so I want to end by thanking uh, all the members of my lab who have been helping on this project, all the patients of endometriosis who have been um, amazing, and it's been so rewarding to communicate with them. And I want to thank our funders, uh, NLM, NSF, and the Endometriosis Foundation of America. Thank you. So you mentioned that uh, the medications self-reported by patients were actually lined up with, with what was seen in the EMR. Um, I was wondering, you know, the, the conventional wisdom is, oh, you can't trust, you know, patients' uh, self-reporting, especially on those, you know, the medical, you know, medication adherence is really bad, big problem. Um, could you 
you know, any insight on that? And, and yeah. um, um, maybe, you know, is it that specific to this, this population? Or? Right. So I'm a big believer in uh, asking the patients and, and trusting them. I think it's specifically when we take things in aggregate and we have large numbers, we can start um, having more confidence in the type of data that we see. I think there are ways to validate this data. Um, we ask the data in many different ways. We also ask them to uh, give us their clinical record whenever they can. They often don't have access to their medical record, so that's you know that's definitely an imitation. Um, but you know, I also am from the camp of the medical record has a lot of issues as well, and there are a lot of errors. And so I think whenever two, you know, we can bring together and match two different types of data set and they give you the same result, that really, really tells us that there's some truth in there. Hi. Hi. So just overall kind of very impressive bridging of technical research with patient engagement and advocacy. And I'm curious, in terms of kind of feedback loops, how are you handling return of results to patients and sharing research findings? And how are you finding that patients kind of are responding to that information and have you been able to inform their responses, use their inf responses to right. inform future research questions? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a huge question and we've been thinking a lot about it. Uh, citizen science is why we like that framework, in fact. Uh, so we report the results mostly through uh, a blog uh, and we do a mix of highlighting other researchers in the area, uh, describing the results of our finding and summarizing other work in endometriosis. Um, the other way in which we try to feedback is we have these tracking challenges when we have a question about a specific aspect of the tracking. So recently we were interested in impact of exercise and so we did a challenge on this and report the results on, on those things specifically. And then we have a lot of back and forth with patients where uh, we go into, there are a lot of patient-led conferences where we go and uh, give results. It's tricky because we, you know, like in other enigmatic conditions, it's a very politicized environment. There are a lot of, um, you know, questions about what's the right treatment and pharmaceutical companies getting in there and people feeling exploited. So we're being very careful to present ourselves as scientists who wanna help patients. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, this feedback loop is really, really important to us. Really fascinating work. This, this issue of patients and providers disagreeing about whether shared decision making took place is an interest of mine. And we've, we've gone into clinics and recorded visits, audio recorded them. And I wanted to specifically ask, you have a lot of audio data and qualitative data. Can you comment on uh, machine learning techniques, not just for transcripts of data, but are, are you actually applying any machine learning to the actual audio files? Yeah, um, so actually we're not doing this in, in here, but I have a different project where we're doing uh, audio transcription of, uh, of encounters of patient and providers. And the way we see machine learning techniques to help is as an indexing of, of the encounter and, and later as a summarization of the encounter to help with documentation, but also to kind of, uh, from a research standpoint, get into what are the actual operational ways in which we can see whether there is shared decision making. So simple things like interruptions, number of questions asked to patients and actual answers back to patients. Uh, and these are you know, techniques available right now to do all of this. Hi. Hi, it is. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. It, it was very interesting to see your uh, the conclusion about the patients and the providers' disagreement and agreement, and also the the apps you built for uh, a better uh, care. I'm curious, what's your uh, have you got any feedback from patients and provider about the usage of the app? Yeah. Um, so we, we, when we talk to patients at conferences and everything, we, we definitely get a lot of feedback. Uh, we have a, a paper under review right now about the engagement and all the different ways in which you can characterize engagement when it comes to these research apps. Um, the, the feedback that we get, 
We find it in things like, you know, on Reddit, someone would say, uh, what app should I use for tracking endometriosis? And people would say, well, of course you should use Fando, and we take it as a huge success. Honestly, I don't even know that it's because our app is that functional, although people say it is. I think it really is because it's a research-based uh, app, and again, patients are so worried about commercialization of their data, privacy, um, sponsoring by pharmaceutical company, and this type of things. Sorry. How about the feedback from the uh, provider side? Have On they... the provider side? Mm -hmm. So on the provider side, right now, they, the way they tell us that they use it is as a prescription. So they do these self-tracking prescriptions. So they're not interested in patients using their, the app for long periods of time, but mm -hmm. they want to you know, try a new treatment and have patients track for like a month, maybe. And mm -hmm. then they want to hear a summary of it. The part that's missing right now is this summary, right? Like, mm -hmm. did it actually help or not? It's hard to tell when you have like day-to-day -day, uh, information, but there are definitely a lot of things we can do with this data to make it more usable to them, and that's what we're working on right now. I understand correctly the feedback from the provider side is they are interested in tracking uh, treatment result day-to-day, -day, but not patients uh, they're not, so they're not interested in the day-to-day. -day. They definitely like the idea of self-tracking because they understand, uh, like all of us, right, that the clinical record is only one view of the patient, but they, they don't have the time to look at day-to-day -day information the same way, you know, um, they don't have the time in the EHR to look at an admission day-to-day. -day. Have you... Uh, uh, yeah. We have, okay, yeah, sure. we're done by 20 seconds, we're done. Thank you so much all.